welcome everyone to this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a few housekeeping points before we go into the main session. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Greg Burke. I'm the Director of Place and Civic Engagement based at Sheffield Hallam University, and I'm also the leader of the Civic University Network. Um, the session this afternoon will be recorded and will be available after this session for people who are not able to be here to have the opportunity to hear what's been said. Um, please do use the Q&A function if you have questions that you want to um, put to our panel at the end. Um, if you put things in the chat function, we will tend to miss them. So please do try and put them in the Q&A function if there are actually questions. Um, please use the chat function for um, wider messaging rather than um, putting in questions. If you do put something in there by mistake, um, our administrative team behind the scenes will hopefully pick them up and move them across so that we don't miss them. But please do try and put them in the Q&A session if possible. Um, this afternoon, we're really looking forward to this opportunity to hear from our two colleagues from um, Nottingham Trent University and the University of Nottingham. Um, we have Fiona Johnson, who is the Associate Director Civic Engagement at Nottingham Trent, and Leonie Mathers, who is the Deputy Director for Advocacy. This is really interesting for us today because this is the second time that we've looked at Nottingham, and it gives us that real sense of um, the journey that these two universities have been on since they started developing their CUA in the original form to where they've got to now. So this is a really good opportunity um, to reflect not just on the beginning of that journey, which we've done with a number of different universities, but to get that sense of this is not the CUA is published and that's the end of the journey, but this is very much more of a sense of that's just the beginning and we'll hear more about how they've moved on since then. I'm going to pass over to Leonie now and then at the end of the presentation we will have quite a long time to take any questions from the audience so please be putting your questions into the Q&A session as we go along and I'll make sure that we pick those up at the end so I'll pass over to Leonie to start the presentation. Thanks so much Greg and thank you very much um, for inviting us along here today we're really grateful for the opportunity to present uh, and to share our views about the journey that we've been on, like you say, it's not um, it's not just a case of signing a civic university, uh, civic agreement and then moving on. So very quickly, our aims and things that we're going to try and hopefully cover in, in the short time that we've got with you. Very quickly, we're going to give a recap of our initial journey, which we spoke about when we were last here, um, which I think was about 18 months ago. And then we're going to give a bit of an update of what we've done since we were last here so the um, refresh process that we've been through with our civic agreement then we're going to share some of the key successes um, some of the things that we think have really popped above the surface since we've started and, and and as we've brought some of these things to fruition and crucially we're going to reflect on some of the factors we think were um, helped make these successes into those successes and some of the challenges that we faced along the way and a bit of a reflection of what those common success factors and the common challenges across those were and we're going to talk a little bit about the communications aspect as well of our partnership and, and how we're working to try and communicate effectively about some of these successes um, to a wider audience than um, just to our internal university audiences. So if we can grab the next slide, please. Fab, so we've been on this path, as you say, we've, um, we were one of the earliest universities to create a civic agreement. Um, in fact, I think we were the first university to have both universities in one city sign a civic agreement with partners across our city. So we've been on this pathway since 2019 and our first agreement was signed in July 2020. So initially our plan was to um, create an impact report, social and economic impact, which was something we'd not done before. I know we, in common with other universities, had, had done the economic impact, but we really tried to bring the social impact and tell some of those stories about the value our universities add um, a bit separately but also mostly together and for our place and then to move that into a plan to do better uh, to work more collab collaboratively going forward to be more intentional about what we were doing in the civic space but as with everybody um, COVID happened so our first agreement was signed in July 2020 at a time when we were very much mired in 
the sort of COVID response as as a sort of collective, as a society, as a community, as cities, as places, we were mad in that that COVID bit. And you know, in hindsight, I think for us, um, what that offered us was an opportunity to really upscale the collaborative work that we were doing. So it absolutely fundamentally shifted what we thought in 2019 was going to be the pathway for this. But it did sort of allow us to overcome some of the challenges of partnership working. So thinking about um, the shared agenda, everybody was working on the same page. It was very clear what our shared priorities were for our area. It was really important that everybody engaged together and we as universities were able to offer something really tangible to our communities. And so we sort of came through that COVID period, we came out of that COVID period with some really good relationships. We'd brought people together, we'd used that um, design process of that initial civic agreement to really shape um, what we could do in a common space. And there was some real willingness and some real engagement from our partners. So it was obviously a super challenging time, but it did help cut through. It provided a bit of an impetus for us to really um, do that partnership working together. So our first agreement was signed by eight partners, which was both universities, our city and county council, the local um, LEP, the local enterprise partnership, and the health partners across the area, primarily because they were the people we'd been working really closely with for the last little chunk of time. So that was our Nottingham University Hospitals NHS Trust, Sherwood Forest Hospitals um, NHS Trust, and the um, ICB, which coordinates the care in the, the sort of primary care across the area. It spanned five themes, economic prosperity, educational opportunity, health and wellbeing, environmental sustainability, and a, a sort of a bit more amorphous one called Unlocking the Universities, which was really about um, accessing academic expertise and also accessing the, the things that were on our campuses. And then these sort of unpacked into the 14 separate initiatives um, where we'd all agreed that a collective approach would really benefit our area. Um, I'll hand over to Fiona, she can tell you a little bit about the refresh that we then went through. Thanks, Leonie. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for having us um, as part of the, the session. Uh, much appreciated. So as Leonie said, you described the, the process around which um, all of our partners convened to set up universities for Nottingham, which was ostensibly driven by the pandemic. But then reflecting on the pandemic and thinking about, well, we've got this wonderful partnership, this burgeoning partnership. We're starting to do some great things within the documented civic agreement. Where do we go from here? And um, it provided us with an opportunity to refresh our civic agreement, to make it more forward looking and to look at um, the recovery from the pandemic, but also to be perhaps even longer term uh, in our thoughts. And I think the first thing to say is when we were considering uh, refreshing the civic agreement, that was in 2021. And we decided um, the, the right approach uh, in discussion with our partners was very much one of evolution. And I think it's probably fair to say that in the discussion with partners in this sense, we're talking about the organizations that are signed up to the civic agreement, the one that um, Leonie has just um, shared with you. Um, so very much evolution, I think that's probably the first, the first thing to stress. Um, we also drew upon um, some of the lessons of what works from when we set the uh, agreement up in, in the first place, because I think this is very much an iterative process as well. It's not kind of throwing everything out and starting afresh. It's building on the strength of what we have. And the sorts of um, approaches that we adopted were things like um, trying to be agile, um, starting with, with, with what we already have, as I mentioned. Um, leaving some space for us to sort of to be flexible and to, to evolve, um, to make sure that we could make, make the most of the, um, the, the contacts and connections that we already have. And as sort of 10 large organisations working together, this permission to collaborate has really unlocked doors as long as you can embed that per per permission to collaborate within and across our respective institutions. So we now have colleagues making their own connections and starting initiatives that would never have happened without this permission to collaborate that was established through the civic agreement. And looking at, you know, how we how we sort of balance what's forward looking 
as opposed to what's sort of something in the pipeline that, um, that we could more easily bring to the fore. So uh, we, we sort of started to look at where, where are we with our current agreement and what are the initiatives perhaps that have already been delivered or have transitioned to business as usual and therefore they don't need to be incorporated in the next iteration of the agreement. But, but what are some of the other initiatives, which um, say, for example, some of our initiatives are linked to um, significant capital developments where we're adding value to. Well, we might not be in control of those uh, from a planning point of view or an external funding point of view. So some of those quite rightly would, would be carried forward. I think also with the civic agreements, and hopefully everyone will agree, that actually scanning the external landscape is so important. What's the, what are the political drivers on your patch, both at a kind of a local level and a national level? Um, here in um, Nottinghamshire, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, as things currently stand, uh, we don't have a devolved administration. Many of you will know that that's something that's being worked towards. And uh, with the... Um, a leveling up and regeneration bill now in place, we will be having mayoral elections next May for a mayoral combined county authority, which will be a new structure. So us being cognizant of that and at a quite an early stage playing in the benefit of the civic agreement, the fact that it is a bedrock of many of these large organizations already working together. And so um, making sure, as I say, that one can horizon scan and make sure that the positioning of one's refreshed agreement is positioned effectively within the external landscape. So that's a little bit about, about the refresh, but um, if we could just move on to the next slide and I could just talk a little bit more about the process itself. Thank you very much. So you can all read the slide. Uh, you can tell that we've set something out that's a linear process. I think it largely was linear. I mean, of course there's some loops back back and, and, and checkpoints. But um, the first thing that we did is within our governance of universities for Nottingham, we have a leaders forum and the leaders are the chief executives and political leaders of all of the um, partner organizations. So the first thing very importantly was to understand from them, you know, the value that they feel they're getting from universities for Nottingham, what new things might they like to bring to the fore. And um, those things were then put into a bit of a hopper, a hopper of ideas that through our next layer of governance on the civic agreement, which is our program management board. So that's sort of executives within those um, very large organizations. And they're very much at the coal face responsible for the delivery of the agreement. So discussing these ideas with members of the program management board and where we felt that there was something new and different that really needed um, some time spent on it as to, you know, did it from a due diligence point of view, did it really have the merit of being potentially a new initiative? Um, what more might need to happen to resource it, to bring it to the fore? So for example, uh, an area of work that's important to us all is equality, diversity and inclusivity, and particularly how that fits with our role as anchor institutions. So in that example, and there are others, but focusing on that, a task and finish group was formed uh, to look at uh, what's happening already from good practice, sharing ideas. And then it was decided that yes, that's something that has real um, appetite and partners would coalesce around it and partners would get involved in helping to deliver it. And therefore it, it, it was put forward into the next iteration of the agreement. And you can see there that, you know, we went through then checking back in with those same governance groups the other way around. And um, we uh, we published our refreshed agreements um, in early 2022, uh, very much with the buy-in of the, of the partners um, that are signed up to the agreement. So they were the partners that we, we liaised with. So I'm going to hand back to Leonie now, who's going to talk us through some of the achievements and reflections. Thanks, Lainey. Thanks. So um, I suppose one thing to say is, although we started this, although I started this by saying it feels like we've been on this journey a really long time, since 2019, and, and you know, we were quite early in the game. Actually, that's not really very long at all. Um, I think everybody that works in a university will know 
that a sort of four or five year period in terms of changing the way a university works is, is is a really um short space of time actually we often think of ourselves as sort of trying to turn around a bit of a tanker in the university space um and in a similar way building partnerships takes a really long time as well um, and getting good effective partnership working is not something that happens overnight and as i say covid sort of helped us along but um but it really does take a lot of time and i think we've spent a lot of the time between then and now building some of the foundations to allow things to come through and it's really only in then the last year or so that we've started to see some of the really big initiatives as opposed to some of those quick wins um come through but we are now seeing some really good interesting things come through that that genuinely um make what we're doing demonstrate the value of what we're doing and the value of the partnership and the value of us adding value together so uh, we're just going to have a quick whiz through and we're going to alternate we've got a couple of examples and this is by no means exhaustive of the things that we've achieved but I think these are ones that we think highlight some of the ways that partnership working have been really positive for us so Fiona thanks Lainey so if we could um, just move on to slide six thank you so much that's great so I, I think one of the, the lessons, I mean, we're not really onto lessons yet, but just in prefacing this, um, the ability of the partnership to leverage in external resources is, is, is pretty fundamental to a successful agreement um, in my view. Um, and one of the jewels in our civic agreements is landing the collaborative, collaboratory doctoral training partnership. Um, we're really proud of that. And you can see that we've leveraged in this, this particular um, funding. But what it does that's, that's, that's different is it's very much um, engaging local people in research. And I know universities do engage local people in research, of course they do, but this is in a quite a systematic and large scale way. So um, the, the program, um, which is funded through the Research England Development Fund, 5.1 million in total, as you can see, it brings together researchers, it brings together community organizations and local people to engage them in research as researchers to bring about meaningful change for local people in Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire. So it's an eight uh, year program. And as you can see there, 50 PhD students and 25 citizen scientists research placements. Um, we're, we're doing really well. Um, it's still early days, but we're currently in the process of recruiting to the second cohort of PhD studentships. The first cohort are eight months into their projects and they're working across a really diverse range of subjects. So to give you a couple of examples, workplace coercion and exploitation in the community, understanding and responding to youth violence and promoting direct democracy in the NHS. They're just a few examples of some of the things that are, are being studied here. So we're really proud of it. And as we move on to the next slide, we're just going to um, share with you what, what we believe some of the success factors are in landing a, a significant program such as this. And we've put together a bit of a diagram, which you can obviously see very clearly on the slide there, but I'll just bring to life a couple of the, the points. I think the first one was, um, we had a wonderful sponsor um, from Nottingham City Council, the chief executive, a gentleman called Mel Barrett, really got behind this as an initiative and invested significant personal time. He also um, participated in the uh, Research England panel when the bid was being considered. And so to have a voice, a strong voice from outside of the universities advocating for the need and importance of a programme such as this um, was a vital part of getting it over the line. I think also um, the university is obviously bringing their expertise in research, but I think because of the partners in our civic agreement, and you will have seen that many of them are, the, are NHS partners, massive, um, important partners, very thinly spread, especially at the moment. So the universities being able to come up with developmental capacity to develop such a bid with our partners and having the expertise to do that is really important. Uh, I think also um, 
the, the, the partnerships that we already had on board, very important. And then for us to be able to demonstrate the mutual benefits um, that can be derived from a, a project as significant as CoLab, that was really important. So enabling our local communities to put forward their own research challenges and then to participate in doctoral research is, is, is perhaps the most important thing. And of course, there's benefit for the universities here, but the actual way in which we can um, do the place-based co-created research using CoLab as a mechanism, I think is vital and vitally important. Mm. And obviously, I guess it goes without saying, aligning your potential funding opportunity, uh, aligning your bid to the potential funding opportunity, and this was very timely. So there's some of the lessons. I mean, it's early days for CoLab. It's, it's very popular. It's a great um, way of convening residents outside of perhaps our normal channels. Um, so it's 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 important and we're we're proud of it and it seems to be going really well. We've now got a next initiative, uh, which I'm gonna hand back to Leonie to talk about, which is our student living strategy. Thanks, Jonas. So the student living strategy featured under the new community connections theme of our um, refreshed civil agreement. This was a joint commitment to build safe and res respectful communities where we'd pledged to develop a collaborative approach to community safety and cohesion through, amongst other things, the delivery of a joint student living strategy. So we've obviously, um, I think for a lot of universities, you'll recognise a sort of certain set of challenges that come with making sure we've both got good student accommodation choices for our students, and in turn, making sure that we and our students are good neighbours to the other communities that we um, live amongst. So this has been something that has been talked about for a long time since since long before I joined the university. So I think, you know, for over a decade, there's been a, a conversation about how do we work together to make sure that that student living piece is really cohesive. And um, this was committed to as part of this student living strategy. It, it, it again was brought to a head through COVID. I would say that particularly in those times, and I know we saw through lockdown and when students were allowed to come back to Nottingham, but other people were still um, living in lockdown conditions and students were starting to learn in lockdown. Um, there was a lot of tension. There was a, a small minority of students across the country as well as in Nottingham um, did, you know, did behave badly and did gather when they shouldn't be. And quite rightly that was picked up on, but it caused a lot of tension. I think it was really visible and, and it really, made us think about how we could proactively think about encouraging that good behavior and, and, and taking that responsibility on. <clears throat> so we took this partnership approach and I think the the bit that we added and the bit that we um this partnership working allowed us to embed was really that holistic approach to the benefits that students bring to our city as well as those negatives which have become really at the forefront of people's minds. So the strategy has set out three core priorities which look at different facets of this so the first is um about student accommodation so we so the priority one is diversify and innovate to improve the quality safety affordability and location of available accommodation for all students across the city and that's really about thinking about what students want from their accommodation i think about where that is and we know that the city council in particular face challenges and and for them there's a bit of a they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't because if they're putting up PBSA lots of people have really strong opinions about that but lots of people also have really strong opinions about students living in um, houses and multiple occupation in um, in other areas of the city so it's a really tough balance and part of this was us committing to do our bit to listen to what students wanted and to help feed that in and to make sure that we were proactively making good decisions together and that we were sharing some of the responsibility on that and that that you know in return the city council had a responsibility to um think about and look at the numbers of students coming and not sort of blame the universities for keeping bringing students to the city and make that sound like a negative which it really isn't but that we would take some of that responsibility as well to, to proactively think about what students are looking for what students want and how we can best build those communities our second priority was around encouraging neighbourliness where students contribute to creating a clean attractive and sustainable environment which supports the well-being of the entire community and this was really about thinking about 
some of those challenges that do come in mixed communities and mixed neighborhoods and and where we as a university have a responsibility to step in and part of that's about education and part of that's about challenging behavior and part of it's about providing and um, helping provide those services so we for example co-fund some community protection officers who are in um some of the communities across the city and that's about making sure that our students are safe and feel safe but also that they're not causing um problems for other residents in the neighbor in the neighborhood and those that want to be asleep at night and not be kept awake at night by um parties which aren't acceptable uh, and so again it's about us working together on that and then the third priority um which is where we fit into the more proactive benefits of the student city is to ensure students are valued members of the communities they reside in and proactively work to improve graduate to maximize graduate retention by developing and promoting opportunities to increase community cohesion and mutual benefit that's really about thinking of, about the benefits that students bring to our city so um opportunities for work placements for example opportunities for volunteering community integration community events and the ways that we can all work together to build strong cohesive communities and and also make our students who come to Nottingham for three years understand how great a city Nottingham is and think about um perhaps staying here when they've finished their studies perhaps making Nottingham their home or, or coming back in a few years when they've um maybe started their career and they're ready to settle down and and live somewhere so that student living strategy is really about having that holistic view of students in our city and how we could work together um, again for mutual benefit so underpinning each priority area we've got an action plan we've got owners in each organization and we're putting that into implementation we've agreed some kpis we've also agreed on um, data sets that we're using to measure this because the other thing that we'd found um, was that there wasn't really a clear and rigorous set of data around students in our communities and the things they were doing and the things that they were engaging with and, and the opportunities that were available to them. And by doing this piece of work and pulling it together, we've been able to create a better articulation of the benefits that our students have and the um, the, the plans for the future. If I'm honest, um, I really can't overstate how, how very political, how very delicate and how very challenging this was at times. It, it, you know, it had become an area where people had some real tensions. It'd become a bit of a sticking point in some of the relationships that um, what, what is really, you know, perhaps poor behaviour by a really small minority of our students in the community became something that was a bit um, blown out of proportion and, and would perhaps become a blocker to the conversations that we were having or the challenges that the city was facing because they were getting challenged by residents on new blocks of purpose-built student accommodation that was going up when people are quite rightly saying, there's housing crisis across this country. Why are you building houses for students and not for other people? Well, those were becoming blockers to other conversations that we wanted to and needed to have with partners across the city. And because it was a point of tension, it became students and student presence in Nottingham was becoming something that was being talked about negatively instead of being talked about as the positive that it is for our city. You know, we we are a city we are a young city we've got lots of students and the students in nottingham bring loads and loads of benefits but when it's overshadowed by some of those challenges and when in particular the politicians because they're feeling the pressure from other places were allowed to talk negatively it, it was allowed to become a bit of a negative thing we really really needed to get back into being able to talk about students in our city as the positive that um, that it is so we'll just go on to the next slide which is the um uh, success factors and on this one you'll see um some challenges as well so i think for us um again so mutual benefit it is really really important it was really important that we did this piece of work um and i think that that had become a bit of a burning platform so so we absolutely needed to do this and that drove us forward even when it was quite tough and even when it was quite political we did have a really senior commitment here um, and I think, you know, having leadership from the top of our university and having a commitment to get things right and having a commitment and a willingness to make compromises where we needed to make compromise and being able to be armed to go into those um, as a collaborative conversation was really important to us. Um, it, it also felt very visible again for that same reason, the there was a reputational point for us going into there that was that was really really important i mean looking at the challenges 
again, facilitation resource, as with all of these things, none of this happens easily. And there was a lot of writing and rewriting and, and sort of changing things and um, a lot of bringing people together, actually, and listening to people. And, and as with always, as institutions, we need to put resource into that facilitation piece. Um, I think the different audiences piece, and, and maybe this comes a bit to the fundamental tensions as well, that was challenging. And the city council, for example, are talking to a fundamentally different audience to us. And I think we wanted to make it clear to our student communities that this was not an attempt to demonize and we were not trying, we were not going to let ourselves be brought into a narrative that that was a sort of lazy, all students are bad and all students cause problems in their communities, because it's just not true. And so part of our job in this was about reassuring our students that this student living strategy is for them and is, is about building the conditions that work for them, whereas the city council perhaps had a slightly different perspective and obviously had a different audience and they were um and they were looking at that and that that did create a bit of attention. But um but but we were able to navigate our way through it. Um, and then obviously, you know, governance. One one lot of university governance is bad enough. Imagine trying to get it through two lots of different university governance and then um, the city council public governance as well, uh, which obviously also needed to be done with a certain amount of public scrutiny. So, um, you know, so, so lots of challenges in there as well as the success factors on this one. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Fiona for the next uh, example. Thanks, Leonie. Um, so an, another example of um, so the, the civic agreement and delivery so far and how we're getting on with our refreshed agreement is something that we've called the expert advisory panel. And this had roots um, it, in the pandemic in actual fact, and it's something that we've um, sort of um, augmented in the new agreement is probably fair to say. So many of you may know that during the pandemic, um, emergency response groups were formed at a national level and they were supported by experts through a scientific advisory group for emergencies with the acronym of SAGE. Um, so one of the things that we were looking at here is with both of the higher education institutions, uh, ourselves um, and the University of Nottingham, something could be formed on a local scale to support the then local resilience forum and wider policy makers as to how they can utilize research, the ex existing um, research base to inform local policy development. So it's around convening groups of academics to utilize existing evidence bases and to bring academic insight to sort of um, topical challenges. So both of the universities administer the group, but the way in which um, it considers challenges or questions is through the governance of universities for Nottingham. So I mentioned earlier about our leaders forum, which is the chief executives and leaders of the partner organizations. They have a role in helping to propose challenges that the expert advisory panel may wish to consider. And also um, in, in the city and county, there's a group called the chief officer forum, which is the, the universities that, and most of our partners are represented on, but it includes the, um, the police, the fire service, probation, DWP, et cetera. And that group, the um, Chief Officer Forum also has a role in proposing questions that the advisory panel may wish to consider. And then that the panel themselves, which is drawn from both academics and practitioners from the universities, and depending upon the challenge, probably practitioners from within the respective organizations. Um, they, they, there's obviously a, a distilling down process because we have far more challenges posed than we have the capacity to, to support. Um, but um, academics consider the evidence and their own provide their own insight too. And depending upon the, the particular question, they provide a summary to policymakers to support the development of an effective and evidence-based policy response. And um, We've done a number of these so far and it's proving to be really popular. So um, a, a couple of examples, supporting NHS trusts to understand the evidence around planning for the winter flu season alongside a potential spike in COVID cases. And then um, one of the things that's under consideration fairly soon 
is the early intervention landscape, particularly in terms of young people and adult services. And that's something that the local authorities would very much like us to look at. So um, perhaps if we could have the next slide, I'll just go into a little bit more detail around the expert advisory panel. And I'll just pull out, as Lainey did with the student living strategy, some examples just to bring it to life. Um, I think one of the things that we've really had to consider, and certainly our academic colleagues have been very mindful of, um, is how we might manage conflicts of interest. Um, because some of the things that um, we're being asked to consider are quite sensitive. Um, so how one um, marries up sort of sensitive subjects, academic freedom and conflicts of interest has been something that we've really had to work our way through. And um, in effect, that way that we've been able to overcome that is through a declaration of interest form. And they're considered by the, the um, expert advisory panel the internal panel that runs the process across both the universities and then a, dis, a sort of professional judgments used um, to make sure that you know nobody's in finding themselves in a difficult position. Um, another thing is that the, the nature of the confidentiality of, of, of some of the questions that we're asked to consider um, and so in response to that we were able to develop a framework and a structure that could manage um, intelligence, shared intelligence that's not in the public domain. Um, and so, you know, how do our partners feel comfortable and confident disclosing such a level of insight and information to make sure that we can, can do justice to the topic and can add real value and insight? You know, we really need to, to get to the, the root of the, of the problem. Um, so a couple of examples there as to how we've sort of overcome some of the challenges. But I think um, just pulling out, you know, well, why is the expert advisory panel being successful? Um, I think a couple of things, we've, we've brought together academics from both universities. So we've been able to really provide complementary um, expertise. I think that's been really important. Um, we've also been able to talk with partners outside the civic agreement, so maybe it might be the fire service, the police, whatever, we've been able to sort of, um, within the, the confidentiality, we've been able to sort of seek diff different views. Um, making sure that we can road test the system so that um, colleagues feel confident in the process. And making sure that we get the exam question right, because sometimes some of the, the things that are posed to the expert advisory panel can be quite willy or a little bit vague and to do justice to them and to make sure that we're considering in inverted commas the right question, how we can co-develop the questions um, with academics and with those posing them has been particularly important because it's quite a lengthy process and it's quite time hungry to consider one of these questions. But we are starting to form a, a really nice sort of um, holding pattern actually of, of questions for the um, advisory panel to consider. So that's another thing that's proving to be really good um, as one of our initiatives. So Lainey, I think we're back back to you now for the next uh, the next section. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the last of the um, uh, sort of substantive examples we're going to share in this. But this is our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Uh, and this is really rooted in a, a drive to create improvement in local employment practice. So as you can see there on the screen, um, across the UFN partnerships, so thinking of the 10 organisations that are now signed up to our civic agreement, um, we reckon they employ over 70,000 local people in our area. And that's massive. And that gives us a big footprint. And that gives us a big um, opportunity to do better as anchor institutions. So um, some of the things that we're doing through the UFN agreement are about our research and are about embedding some of those opportunities there. But this is really about our role as anchor institutions and our ability to bring people together to do something positive for our area. So um, recruitment and retention obviously is a is a big issue at the moment. And I know we've seen a lot of people um, sort of changing their place post-COVID. The workforce is changing a little bit and everybody's 
got an incentive to work on recruitment and retention. Everybody also has an incentive across our anchor institution, public sector organisations. We've all got um, sort of statutory incentives really to work on this EDI agenda to make sure that our workforces are accessible to and reflective of our local communities. And that's that's a really important way that we um, set out our footprint. So this really made sense. Um, this area really made sense for us. And there was a lot of drive and a lot of interest. Um, we started by creating a new forum to discuss the potential of what we might be able to do in this area. And um, our own executive board level EDI champion, who is our first Pray Vice Chancellor for EDI People and Culture, was really keen to lead this piece of work personally as well. So um, we're really grateful to her for that. Through that forum, we set some priorities around clear and visible leadership on EDI. So um, talking about the value that our executive board level EDI champion had brought and, and whether that could be reflected in those other public sector organisations, um, thinking about mechanisms for our cross organisational partnership working um, and using our collective purchasing power and our collective recruitment power to drive that positive change locally. And then obviously to help um, em embed that in other organisations across our area and, and sort of demonstrate the value and the positive work that that can do. So mindful of the amount of work uh, that obviously we've put into a lot of these other areas, we were able to demonstrate the strategic value um, of, of this project and get some facilitation results. So we've been able to recruit um, an EDI, uh, an EDI task force project manager for us to help drive this forward and to help do some of that connecting piece. Because I think again, one of the common challenges we found across these in in partnership working of all sorts, it's about bringing people together and and people having enough headspace to move out of just trying to deliver at the sort of on the treadmill and, and running to keep up with themselves in their own organisations, but bringing that together to maximise what we're able to do collectively and to find and dig out some of the ways that we can maybe reduce everybody's workload in our own organisation by sharing some of the best practice that we're each individually developing. So um, some of the things we're doing, we are looking to share best practice. We're looking at how we can collate and then share a set of resources um, on a web page with everybody who signed up um, and, and potentially other organisations as well, we'll be able to access and we'll be able to look at what we're each doing in our organisations and how we've assessed them and whether they're working and whether they're things that could be dropped into their own organisations. And um, we're looking potentially at whether some sort of a local charter or a local statement of intent around EDI that sets out some of the things we're keen to do could help us uh, move things forward, but also bring in some of those other um, potentially private sector organisations who are also really keen and really committed to do the right thing on EDI um, and set a little a, a little maybe Nottingham benchmark for progress. And there's some really interesting proposals coming forward on crossworking as well. So we're thinking about um, shared job fairs and where we advertise the roles um, in our organisations, which are the same. I think, you know, one of the things we're mindful of is people look at universities and think, well, you know, I'd have to be an academic to work there. And as we all know, that's not true. You know, there are public affairs people and there are comms people and marketing people and there are HR professionals and cleaners and um, people working right across our organisations that are jobs which absolutely our local population should be more aware of than they are and should be thinking of us as a really good place to come and work. Um, but thinking as well about how we do progression and how we help um people progress their organisations. So thinking about circumference or mentoring across potentially the different organisations who've signed up to the civic agreement, thinking about work experience and um, social mobility and, and how we build links so that people are given opportunities and encouraged to progress. And so just on the next slide, we've got again some um, success factors and some of the challenges. Again, we can see that senior champions bit was really, really important, having some um, sort of senior support and some real buy-in and emphasis and, and, and uh, encouragement to do this piece of work. Um, there's a statutory responsibility here in that EDI space, which obviously everybody's doing some of this work and everybody's reporting against this work. So there's quite a lot of data and quite a lot of impetus to do it. And if we can reduce our own, um, if we can share the load and reduce the, the workload burden on each of us, that's a benefit to us all as well as to our communities. Um, we've also got some good academic expertise in this area. Um, 
and I sort of say this is about around institutions rather than about our research base, but we've got some really good people doing some really good research into how we make big organisations like ours more equitable, more accessible, um, and more effective of our local communities. That's uh, really important. Challenges again, so facilitation resource, as I've mentioned, and, and we've been able to bring in a bit of resource for that, but originally it took a bit of a while to get moving, not because everybody wasn't really committed, but because everybody just didn't have that additional time um, to do the bit of facilitation work that was needed. And I think, you know, sustainability, we've marked that as a bit of a challenge. Um, the idea is that we'd really like these um, interventions that we put in place through the work or through this task force to become sustainable, for this to just be embedded within our HR programmes and for, for these to not be thing be a thing that needs ongoing facilitation resource, but that people take these on and, and embrace these um and and become just part of what we do, the business as usual. So so we've put it in as a challenge. I think it's a challenge to us to ensure that it is sustainable going forward. Um Fiona, over to you again. Thanks, Leonie. So um if we could just move on to the next the next slide, that would be great. Thank you so much. So we're starting to uh, come into our last few slides now. Um, and really what we wanted to just have a look at here is some of the um, factors that we feel have really helped us mobilize and deliver the various, well, there's 15 initiatives in our civic agreement and obviously some are further ahead than others. Um, I think I'll, I'll just pull out some of them. Um, we've, we've already touched on the high profile champion a couple of times, uh, which is really important. I think the developmental capacity is another one that really stands out for me. Um, our partner organizations, as I mentioned, are, are, are thinly, um, thinly spread, particularly our NHS partners. You know, they've got so many other priorities. And um, it's so important that the universities can put in developmental capacity to seed different initiatives. And also where we can try to bring in external funding to capacity build and enable us to really get these initiatives off the ground. Um, I can't stress that one enough. Um, and, and the incentive, I guess, really, that's a successful bid. Um, as long as one can agree a pipeline early on and agree together what bids one might look at, um, it, it relies very much on the universities to pull these things together. Um, where we have established collaborations, that's really important. So. Another example would be um, in the sustainability agenda, uh, NTU initially developed something called the Green Rewards app, which enables individuals to um, calculate their, you know, to take different actions and then calculate their CO2 savings. And through the, the development of the app, uh, which was brilliant, it's been adopted across uh, University for Nottingham Partners, but also from many other local authorities, so uh, our district and borough councils. And there's been some amazing publicity linking back to local businesses, local small businesses that have been incentivizing their customers to adopt the Green Rewards app. So that's been a brilliant example and something that's really mushroomed in terms of its scale through something really quite simple. And that connects us into to local residents as well. Um, I think also um, we, we touched very much on the EDI and the learnings from that um, and how LA only mentioned that within the EDI work, uh, the University of Nottingham is funding a project manager. Again, without that additional capacity, it would be very difficult to mobilise an initiative such as that. Um, and I think how we can make sure that we continue to demonstrate, you know, the investment of partners time in universities for Nottingham and that what the results are to, to make sure that we're closing that loop, that it truly is an iterative process and we're taking our partners with us. I think particularly for our partners, um, the way that the city and county is um, geographically spread, we have a lot of our partners within the city and then others sort of further away, still within the county, but geographically dispersed. And it's making sure that all of the, or are certainly a significant range of initiatives have in have interest and can captivate partners uh, ac across the county as well certainly that's something that I think is an important learning point um, 
I think, Lainey, that's perhaps my all my points on the common success factors. And if I hand back to you for the communications area. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, just before we finish, um, we wanted to touch on comms a little bit as well, um, partly because I lead the advocacy team. And so we're part of external relations and, and comms is a big part of my remit. Uh, and also going back to 2019, comms is really a big part of why we start to do that. I know, um, you know, it it can be challenging to tell some of our story about how we engage with our communities. But when we first did the piece of work, when we first looked at our social impact alongside our economic impact, for example, it was with a mind to showing our local communities and showing our own communities, showing um, our staff and students as well, some of the positive things that we do and we sort of describe our civic impact in a way as, as there is an incidental civic impact to what we do. We have an impact on our communities just by nature of being and doing what we would be doing anyway. And um, and really the bit of work that we're doing through our civic agreement is to move towards a more intentional, um, deliberative way of doing our civic impact and having a civic impact. But, but communicating that is a really important part of it because... Um, think we do sometimes and we've sort of seen in a political sphere universities have had a bit of a tough time we seem to be on the wrong side of every um, possible battle we're, we're we're definitely sort of both too woke and also too ivory tower simultaneously and we're um it, it can be hard I think to make our case and it can be hard to cut through with a lot of the positive things that we do and um, partly because we do lots and lots of really good things and some of them don't feel like they're um big enough to shout about. I know we certainly felt that lots of the progress under, under our civic agreement didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily the sort of thing that merited its own press release. A sort of EDI task force is a really good piece of work and we're delivering some good things, but it, but it wasn't necessarily going to get um, a press release or get shouted about in its own right. So what we've done earlier this year is to bring together a, um, a, a public facing achievement report, which you can see on the screen here some of the pages of and this was really about bringing it because actually I think the sum of the parts of what we're doing here uh, is really massive and really is worth talking about so we um, pulled together this achievements report uh, there's a, a sort of couple of pages spread for each of those themes and just some of the stories and we've tried to keep it quite light and quite engaging and really tell some of the the stories and um, you can see on there for those of you who are good enough eyesight there's a little bit of stats in there as well but but keeping that to a minimum and mostly demonstrating what the breadth of it is we did and I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to offer that narrative about how we're doing intentional civic impact about how we're taking our responsibilities as anchor institutions and as big employers locally um seriously and how we're using that for good and around that and if we can just um, go on to the next slide which I think might even be the last slide uh, we were really keen to do some other comms around this as well. So rather than just creating a PDF report and, and mailing it out to some of our um, key stakeholders, which is good and which we did as well, but we also ran a bit of a social media campaign echoed across both of our um, social media, but also our partners also echoed this on, on their social media channels for us, which helped us reach a good, broad, interesting, diverse range of people. And we've sort of demonstrated in these little ways, tried to pull out some little nuggets um, that, that are able to demonstrate some of the ways we've done it. We've also refreshed our website, uh, we did a bit of user experience work to try and pull people through it and, and think about what it is that they would be looking for on that site. We've thought a little bit more about doing regular um, blog posts and doing little updates, which is really our way of communicating the little things that, like I say, wouldn't necessarily merit um, a, a press release. Not everything is press release worthy, but it does add up to tell a story of, of us really intentionally doing these pieces of work and that, that some of these don't just happen, but that there are people involved um, making it happen and driving it forward um, and, and linking our messages uh, into government policy priorities, for example. So we're very much thinking about environmental sustainability. We're thinking about the levelling up agenda. We're thinking about the place-based agenda um, and the sort of economic growth of our region. And we're trying to um, 
demonstrate our fit and demonstrate our engagement in those communities, strengthen our relationships. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is raise awareness of a lot of those positive local impacts that we have and give people some of these messages and, and help them to share some of the bits that we need um, for when we're having those other bigger conversations or perhaps tougher conversations at other times. We want those key stakeholders and we want the people of Nottingham to understand some of the things that we do in the area and uh, and to be able to um, understand our, our impact and our footprint. Uh, so I think that's everything from us. Fiona, have you got a little? We've got one closing slide. Yeah, if, if we could move on to that. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, closing slide um, is really the what next. And um, so I think the first thing I, is that we sort of mentioned earlier is around the fact that this is very much an iterative process and I'm sure other colleagues with civic agreements exactly the same, um, always making sure that we can review and reflect, thinking about you know what works, what can we scale up, um, what, what's sustainable in terms of initiatives, you know, what's transferring to business as usual. So that's important. Um, we're, we're very fortunate, we're proud to be part of the National Civic Impact Accelerator Action Learning Set. And we're certainly going to, uh, well, we are uh, very much an active participant, making sure that we can derive um, the most mutual benefits from that. Um, and also, you know, help us think about how we can measure our impact. Um, and how can we can refine our thinking here? Um, how we can do more to report uh, the, the outputs of our work to a range of different audiences, particularly our local residents um, across the city and across the county, some of whom may not be engaged with the universities. We'd like to try to help them make that connection, the good work that the universities are doing in their, in their area and hopefully engage them in that too. Um, I think uh, the advent of the mayoral combined county authorities I mentioned earlier, making sure that, I mean, we've made some great strides um, already, but making sure that uh, universities for Nottingham and all of the work that we do can help to support the achievements of devolution, particularly as we're going to be in the first round of devolution. Um, and making sure that we can continue to scan externally the political landscape and making sure that we can continue to position our initiatives in that way. And uh, I don't think we're quite ready to think about a further refresh. My colleagues would probably kick me under the table if they could. I think we've got some way to go with the current um, civic um, sort of agreement before we can even think you know about how we might refresh that and then do we have the right partners etc that's probably a bigger conversation but I suppose just in summing up to say that we've always got one eye on the future as well as thinking about delivering this agreement and making sure that our partners who are signed up to the agreement find that the initiatives are of good quality that they feel they want to Im sort of immerse themselves into them and to commit valuable staff time. So they're probably a, a bit of a kind of canter through some of the next steps. And I'm now going to hand back to Greg Burke, our chair, to take us through the next session. Thanks, Greg. Um, thank you very much to, to both of you. <clears throat> I think that's been a really interesting um, discussion. I think for me, the, the real sense of energy around delivery rather than the focus being on how to produce a CUA has been really interesting. I was just going to pull out a few sort of observations before we go into the questions of which we've got quite a few. Um, I think for me, there were a number of sort of points that you made that I think are really helpful for other for all of us to, to think about, really. Um, one of them around understanding the local political landscape. I think you you both referenced that a number of times, and I think that is absolutely critical that as institutions we have to operate within that local landscape, and that local landscape is different, and actually it makes a big difference as to how we go about doing the civic stuff. The point you made, again, about long-term. This is about long-term change. This is not about making quick um, things. This is about part of why universities have a key role to play is because we are long term we're here for the long term many other institutions come and go we actually have longevity the point you made about being 
building partnerships takes time and commitment. And I think often we underestimate just how much energy and time is required to make real partnerships work. It's very easy to feel that we've made partnerships, but actually those real partnerships, they're going to make delivery and make real change happen, do take commitment, they take time, they're not built overnight. Um, your point around senior commitment, I thought was really interesting. And I think that's absolutely critical. You know, if, if we're going to make things happen in this space, we need senior commitment, both within our own institutions, but also from the, the partner organisations that we're trying to work to. And I think we're starting to see that it is when those people come together and really have a commitment that things start to happen. So for me, there were just a few of the observations that I thought were really interesting from what you were saying. I'll, I'll now go into the questions. Our, our first question um, was around um, COVID, really. Um, and you mentioned you'd sort of come together through COVID and the whole sort of thing. And I think really this question is trying to get at what is it that brings people together? So obviously COVID brought people together. It was a crisis. But how do we bring people together around um, making things happen if we don't have a crisis, what might be, your, from your experience, the ways in which we can bring people together? I can have a start on that if you want, Fiona. I think, <clears throat> I think to some extent, you know, there's always going to be some impetus. You know, if you say a time and there's no crisis, I mean, it, it feels like sometimes that we go from one um, crisis to another crisis, and there's lots of different things springing up, and there are lots of things. And I think, you know, were it not COVID, or now that we're in a, a sort of post-COVID world, actually. Um, one of the things that's driving us to work together is about funding. You know, councils in particular have less funding. Um, healthcare has less funding. Universities are, are sort of starting to get a bit less funding. We're certainly feeling that squeeze as well. And we're all trying to think about how to do things more efficiently mm -hmm. and better and where we all support each other's ambitions in that. And, and I think that there are loads of opportunities where if we can identify a challenge that we're all trying to solve or that we're all working on together that helps bring us together and you know looking at another space is sustainability which we haven't really talked much about today but is another key plank of, of the civic uh, agreement that we're working on and again you know sustainability is a massive challenge and some might even say a crisis that we're all facing that we're all trying to respond and adapt to so i don't think we'll ever be short of crises to sort of focus our energy around if I'm honest um but I do think having that real and I think it came across in it and those um success factors and certainly when we were looking spotting the mutual benefit and yeah. having a mutual objective is really really important so it might not be sort of crisis focused but there will always be an impetus and, and it's and it's finding where that mutual benefit is that helps make it easier to bring that collective will together Thanks, Tony. Um, Fiona, do you want to ask it? Add anything to that? Sorry. I think yeah, I just do add that you need a convener, and really, that's been the role of the universities. Um, and I do agree with the the person who posed the question. I think yeah, COVID was the challenge uh, that brought us together, but we've been able to build from that. And so I think it's identifying the shared need in the way as, as Leonie's articulated, but it's then the convener to actually make something happen. Okay. Thanks. Um, the next question, which I think is a question we often get in these sessions, um, how much resource, um, and it's a, it's a difficult question probably for you to answer, um, but you might want to say just a, a bit around how you sort of structure it um, in each of your institutions, how much resource are you putting into this sort of civic work as institutions? Um, Fiona, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, I will. Um, thank you, Greg. I suppose at NTU, Nottingham Trade University, we're very proud of our civic DNA and um, the whole university really is largely mobilised uh, around a civic agenda. And we have within our university strategy, we have five different strands and one of those is called enriching society. And that's the rich theme of all of the civic work that we do. So certainly for us, our civic work extends beyond the civic agreement. So whilst we're um, proud and deeply engaged in universities for Nottingham, we do do other civic work too, that may be complementary, but outside of that. Um, but to try and answer it from universities for Nottingham, I suppose um, if we were looking at communications, for example, then we're drawing on the university's communications team and communications expertise. 
Um, so we're drawing on shared resources, but we do have for universities for Nottingham within NTU, we do have a dedicated project manager, um, a full time person, and that's amazing. But we also have, for example, um, some of the of, of other team members, such as myself and our pro vice chancellor, etc. So I think it's very difficult mm. to quantify. Yeah, um, that, that was my but, sense. It's, yeah, but, it's, it's, as I say, it's a question. Um, people often ask on this yeah. webinar, so it's interesting. Uh, Leah, I don't, do, uh, Leonia, you want to come back on that? Just, just to say really similar, so we've got a civic um, strategic delivery plan as a university, which encompasses a lot more than just the universities for Nottingham um, sort of collaborative efforts. And we've obviously got uh, various bits around the university. We have a, a pro vice chancellor who has responsibility for our civic area, um, who's also a faculty pro vice chancellor, um, but does a good job in providing that senior leadership and is on our executive board. Um, as Fiona says, actually, um, also super grateful to have uh, a civic, so a person who is almost full time on on this role. And I know Jenny at the university and uh, Rebecca at NTU are are you know great and add absolutely tons of value in this space. And that's really important. And I think you know we certainly wouldn't have got as far as we've been able to get without <clears throat> that bit of dedicated resource, really. Um, driving it forward and having the energy and the passion for, for building a sort of civic agenda. Okay, thanks. Um, there are a couple of questions I'll try and bring together. They're not quite the same question, but um, I think we might be able to answer them in, in one, which is around sort of engagement with local communities, really, and partly about what has been your experience of actually engaging with the public directly, um, engaging communities, but also a dimension as has any of this led to creating sort of community paid roles that might be um, working to support your civic agenda in either of your institutions? That I can um, kick off with that. I think, yeah. you know, the, the lots of the different projects have different ways of engaging with um, the community. So, for example, the student living strategy, we did some really um, deliberate focus grouping work we did some really structured work to engage with communities and to understand and um, their perspectives um obviously the co-laboratory dtp project in itself is all about how we do that community work and i know the work that we're doing with um the uh, impact accelerator program is about thinking about how we do more work with the community and how we really embed those community voices so i think it, it's something that we're um, that we're working on and that there are some established mechanisms within our institutions for, for dealing with people and for listening to people and for really bringing them into the things that we're developing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we own any of those challenges mm. or any of those channels as UFN um, and perhaps into you, I think, are even a little bit more developed in, in this space. Yeah, I think Thanks. certainly for universities, for Nottingham is, is something that there's more there that we could do. I think the CoLab example of how we engage local residents in research, both undertaking research and the research agenda is one good example. But I think there's more to do as we continue to gain momentum and things bed in. I, I think it's some, certainly something that we would like to do more. There are some um, nuggets of really good examples. Um, you know, it might be a sort of a, a student project or, or something. And um, actually, one thing that, that that brings to mind is that, we have a joint post now across both our student unions mm -hmm. and that post holder, part of their responsibility is around uh, resident engagement. So that's just, there are some, a couple of tiny diamonds here, but um, I think there's more that, that we would like to do as we move forward in terms of perhaps wider scale engagement with our residents. Thanks. Um, the UFN Leaders Forum, um, a couple of questions around how does this sort of fit with other existing governance that you had in place? What what was the sort of thinking behind setting it up and how does it work in relation to those groups of people coming together in other forums? OK, I'll have a go at that one if you like. Well, um, the Leaders Forum, so it's the chief executives and political leaders of, of the partner organisations of which, including the universities, there's 10. And they come along to um, help make sure that the uni that universities for Nottingham is forward looking and is effectively sort of positioned in the, in the sort of political landscape 
and they're always looking at um, you know, horizon scanning, future initiatives, etc. And um, in, in the case of our university, um, papers and documents that are developed for the Leaders Forum would go through our own executive channels. And I'm and I'm I, I'm only making the assumption I don't know I don't know about all of the others, but it's incumbent upon the the leader to um, as to how they might knit those things into their respective organisation, and also their their, their program um, management board representative who tends to be director level, how the governance uh, works between those two uh, people within their own organisation as well. So the Leaders Forum is really the strategy of universities for Nottingham, forward looking, and the programme management board is the delivery of the civic agreements. And then it's, it's incumbent upon each member really to knit that in to their own organisational governance. Thanks, Fiona. Lynn, do you want to add anything to that? Or Yeah, just, just to add, I think we, both Fiona and I would absolutely say we, we recognise the underlying sentiment of that question, which is everybody's got a lot of meetings and um, it's another... It, it, it's sort of the time that we bring people in fact I think Fiona and I are both in a meeting tomorrow in one of those other forums that brings mm. together chief executives of the organizations which is actually talking about the fact that there are probably too many um there are too many of these meetings that bring together the same set of people and that we need to think about which ones add value the reason or or the unique bit that the leaders forum brings that perhaps some of the other or the, the other groupings might not is because we have this bit of delivery focus because a bit of this is about bringing resource and because having senior buy-in for the things that we're agreeing is really important to then being able to deliver against them this um and it doesn't happen i think we're every six months for the leaders forum um we come together and it's uh relatively informal but there is always um on the agenda there's sort of deep dives into some of those delivery projects that we're working on and it's an opportunity as well for those leaders to take back into their own organizations this is actually really important and this is a priority or for them to feed back to us and to, to shape collectively the agenda of of saying do you know what that is important but this actually is our priority mm. at the moment we really like everybody to go back into their organizations and focus on this collective challenge and it is a good um relatively free-flowing discussion that that does help guide that and so hopefully what those leaders feel and, and the reasons that they are well attended is that it does feel like an opportunity to sort of shape a collective direction and, and a collective delivery mechanism. No, that, that's really interesting. Um, the next question, um, I think it's a really interesting one, um, which is, I suppose, in this space of as we as institutions step out and say, we want to do things which are beyond our remit, we want to work in the civic space. How do you, how have you managed expectations so that people don't start to say, ah, oh, right, these are all the problems of Nottinghamshire, you're wanting to solve them, get on and do it sort of thing. So how have you um, scoped that work that you do so that it is doable, it's reasonable, and it's not taking on all the problems of the place where you are? Um, I'll yeah, you, that that yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question. Um, it's the co-development of the different initiatives with the partners and us having to be quite um, targeted, I guess, because it's the, the civic agreement's not just for the universities to deliver, it's co-developed and it's co-delivered. So I think um, at the time in which uh, the initiatives are being constructed, um, thinking back to the slide around, or one of the slides around the refresh of the agreement, we talked about setting up task and finish groups to look at new initiatives. And that was exactly that. It was some due diligence. You know, if there was an initiative, for example, the EDI one that we were talking about earlier, well, what really is going to be the goal of that? And perhaps convening a small stakeholder group to do some early stage work, looking at good practice, for example, and then getting the group together to actually scope the initiative and agreeing that it's better to take on fewer things and do them well than to try to take on too much. So thinking about resource constraints, thinking about internal capacity and internal academic appetite, for example, and having to go through a process for each potential initiative. So not everything is going to make its way into the, into the agreement, but better to do that at the front end with the working with the governance structures that we have prior to things being adopted. So I think everything goes into the hopper 
And then there's a process by which the partners decide what's realistic and uh, um, tangible thanks. to deliver. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, uh, Leonie, do you want to add anything to that? Just the other thing that I would add is that the, the, the sort of genesis of that comes from really that original bit. So going back to the COVID um, days and those those early days, I think what we found immediately as we sort of, you know, those that late March, early April bit of time, the universities do have a lot of resource, but actually we also have a lot of entryways. There's, there's not a single front door for a university. And so there were lots and lots of asks that lots of different very worthy very important um organizations and, and causes came into us but what that sort of meant was that people who worked with a particular part of the hospital for example might be trying to shift across some some resource or some aspect across to them because they want to help and because it's absolutely um the well-meaning the right thing to do but it might not be the strategic thing to do and we found in those very early days when there were a lot of asks coming at us, we put in place quite a robust process that says, don't just, you know, give away university resources mm. because you think it's, you know, because you think that's a priority because you happen to know the person that's working there. Every request needs to come into this fixed central point. Um, and, and we fixed the partners and we looked at who are the strategic partners and we asked each organisation to give us a point of contact. So we said, we know if something comes in from Nottingham University Hospitals Trust that I, as the university contact, can go to my named hospitals contact and can say, is this a priority for you? And if it's a priority for you, then I'll go away and find a way to make it happen. But what we're doing is being strategic and we're, we're then able to escalate things. And so I think that spirit, again, has sort of carried with us. And, and so rather than this being a sort of opening of the floodgates to say, mm. hey, doing civic things now, throw all your civic asks at us. What it said is there is a structured way that we can escalate these, that we can go to our leaders and that we can jointly agree what are the priorities, not for me and my little department here, but for us as an institution and for us as an institution with our what's best for Nottingham hat on, that we can make those decisions collectively and hopefully make better decisions out of it. Yeah, that's no, really helpful. And you've actually answered another question inadvertently. So that's very helpful. Well, we may be intentionally. Um, the, the next question, again, um, one we often get in these sessions, but um, we want to keep asking it because it's one we all continue to struggle with. Um, you've talked a little bit about this, I think, but maybe not so much in the sort of broad sense of the question is, how do you measure the success of your work? And I think you've made quite a bit of reference to how you've measured perhaps individual initiatives or individual things that you've done. I just wonder whether there's anything more you could say around whether you have an overall sort of evaluation approach to the total um, CUA. I think that's something that we're developing. I mean, as you mentioned, Greg, we do have individual initiatives, of course, are monitored like CoLab, for example. <laughs> but I think with our work through the National Civic Impact Accelerator and others, mm. I think that's important. Um, I think one thing, when we uh, started our work together, when we were actually doing the exploratory phase before we set up universities for Nottingham, we did do a, a piece of work to understand the economic, social and cultural impact of the universities. Whether or not we would look at, you know, we did some polling and all sorts of stuff, you know, whether we would look at anything like that again moving forward, I'm not sure. But I think measuring the impact um, and the success of it, perhaps with some of the softer measures, attitudinal measures, I think that's something that we've not yet really grappled with in full. I think that's certainly something that we, we're keeping in mind as we move forward. We know it's something we need to do more of. Um. Leonie, you're nodding. You're okay. You don't want to come in. That's that's fine. Um, the next question is a really interesting one, and not one that um, I've seen before in any of the previous sessions we've done. Um, it's asking about have you thought about or involved the private sector at all in your civic university agreement? And if you have or haven't, what was your sort of thinking around that, um, Leonie? I don't really want to kick off. Yeah. So so. Have we thought about, yeah, absolutely. And have we have we actively evolved them, you know, not really to this point. And I think that's partly because the partnership working in itself, as we've sort of touched on already, it's, it's quite tough to get good partnership working happening. And 
um, the the organisations that we've got involved, we've, we've, we've just about got to a, a good working relationship and we sort of um, are able to drive things forward. And I think we're really mindful of something becoming unwieldy or becoming a sort of, you know, you, you could bring everybody in. I think what we're trying to do, we, we are mindful of it though. We are mindful that there's lots of private sector organisations doing really good things that again are for the benefit of our city as much as anything else and, and we are really keen to harness that and so we're thinking in specific areas so for example the EDI task force is a really good example the work that we're doing is also being replicated across the private sector lots of people are thinking about recruitment and retention lots of people are thinking about EDI and about how we create good workplaces for everybody and so we're looking at once we've once we've got ourselves into a good space we'd really like private sector partners to be part of that with us because we know there's some really really good practice happening um right around Nottingham you know some of the people that we work with quite a lot have got really good programs so we do want to bring them in we do want to sort of make the most of it if we're honest the reason that we um haven't I mean in terms of formal signatories that's at anchor institutions we probably if we're honest I know looking across the country different um, civic agreements have different sets of even anchor institutions signed up um, and and that's always an interesting bit of you know are there other people we could add in absolutely there are at what point does it become unwieldy you know we're still thinking through that in our own right but that will undoubtedly evolve um, but there is some some thinking about how do we bring those private sector partners who are really committed to actually the full breadth of things we want to try and do and who are engaged across a number of areas and um and how do we you know is there could there be an associate membership mm-hmm. or associate signatory type model maybe then um, could it be that it's on a case-by-case basis and that's probably what we're looking at at the moment um that there's a point certainly where we'd like to open up engagement with the EDI task force for example so we are definitely thinking about it we're definitely open and, and sort of actively considering it but as with everything else there's a sort of facilitation resource question that the more people are around the table the more um the, the more facilitation that mm-hmm. takes yeah Fiona do you want to add anything to that no uh no that's great thank you Greg that's fine um I'm conscious of time so um our final question and then we'll I'll give you both chance just to say any final comments before we finish um is around um student engagement so this again is um an aspect which um, we continue to sort of um, explore and try and grapple with really. And uh, um, the question is really, uh, to what extent, or have you to a, at all at this stage, involved your student body in your sort of civic delivery? Is it something you've um, talked about, thought through? Um, Fiona, do you want to start? And then... Thanks, Greg. I think it's something that we've thought about and something that we'd like to do more of. We've made a start through um, both the, well, really through the appointment of the joint post mm-hmm. uh, that, rep, you know, connects both of our student unions. Um, and that, that, post, that post holder has a civic role as well. And we've started to engage with him much more frequently around what we're doing with universities for Nottingham. Um, so it's a start. Um, and there's there's certainly a lot more that we would, we would like to do. I mean, clearly we, we link with our students, with many of those um, member organisations who are major employers. Of course, there's a relationship with the universities in different ways, whether that's through placements, work experience, et cetera. But in terms of our macro level with this, with the civic agreement, we've made a start, but I think there's more that we could and would like to do. Yeah. Um, Leonie, do you want to add anything to that? No, you're okay. Um, I'll just give you both chance to say any final words and then I'll close up so Leonie anything you wanted to say as a final statement or comment um so just to say again um really uh grateful for the opportunity to come and speak on this and to share our experience it's been um really uh interesting process certainly to have been involved from the start um also to say thanks to the teams who are are sort of in our teams and who are working but also those others across the university because there's there is lots of really good work that goes in and and most of the things that go really well in civic agreements are because there are individuals who are really passionate about delivering and delivering good things for our community and who are just really engaged and 
and you know frankly we talk a little bit about the facilitation resource but a lot of it is delivered by people who are doing things on the side of the rest of their job because they actually really care about it and because they think we can do better when we work together so it's been a real um it's been a real positive experience um for me certainly being involved in helping to facilitate some of that getting that senior buy-in getting that real clear steer from our leaderships that that being intentionally civic, being proactive in the space is something that they're keen for us to do and for us to take that um, that responsibility forwards and to to grow this space. Um, so, yeah, I hope, I hope that everybody is mm. feeling that, that same positivity from their institutions and, and getting that same backing because it really does make all the difference, I think, to be able to harness the good work that's happening. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Fiona, any final comments? Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'd just like to thank the Civic University Network for inviting us. It's been a pleasure and for all of the excellent support that all of the colleagues have provided and our colleagues within our own institutions as well and helping us put all of this together. It's been a pleasure. And um, I haven't really got anything more to, to add other than to express our thanks and um, also for raising such great questions, um, mm. things to really make us think and things that we'd like to, to do more of. So, um that, that was really it, it yeah thank you. Well, well thank you both I mean I think it's been a really interesting um session and as I say for me that sense of movement of you know from writing CUAs to coming now through the challenges of delivery that sense of reflecting and learning um is has just been great so it's been a really stimulating session and like you guys I think the questions have been great really stimulating and absolutely the things that collectively we're, we're trying to address and thanks to you two and thanks for the team uh, who've pulled this together and um, there's just a few things on the screen um, that we want to bring to your attention um, the upcoming events so that people are aware of them if you're not yet a subscriber to our newsletter we encourage you to subscribe um, so that you can keep up to date with things that are happening um, and hope to see you again at one of these sessions shortly. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay, bye.